The International Society of Fire Service Instructors, in partnership with our friends at Blue Card Command, Honeywell First Responder Products, Scott Safety, the IAFC Volunteer Combination Officers Section, and the IAFC Safety, Health, and Survival Section is proud to present this training video, which is the culmination of two years of fire behavior research. The ISFSI was honored to receive two years of AFG funding from the Department of Homeland Security, which has revolutionized modern fire tactics. The research findings are a catalyst for saving thousands of lives. The International Society of Fire Service Instructors is proud to present Principles of Modern Fire Attack, Slicer's training video. Hello, my name is Eddie Buchanan. I'm a past president of the International Society of Fire Service Instructors and a division chief with Hanover Fire and EMS in Richmond, Virginia. Today I'm here in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where the research into how we fight fires continues. In recent years, research like this conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NUL, has shed light on the way we operate, and in some cases, challenged practices we have accepted as routine for years. Our goal today is to highlight the key lessons from the research and give you some ideas that will help you incorporate these lessons into your department's operations. First, our fires are more volatile than they were in years past due to increased synthetics used in home furnishings. Coupled with lightweight building construction techniques and energy efficient features in homes, these new fuels have challenged us to reevaluate our best practices for fire extinguishment. Another key bullet point from the research includes the early application of water to reduce the thermal threat to firefighters. Historically, we've been reluctant to apply water early particularly from the exterior positions, because we believe the fire stream could push the fire from the burn to the unburned portions of the fire building. The research has proven this belief to be false. In fact, the water only improves conditions in the fire building, greatly reducing temperatures for both the potential occupants of the building and the firefighters operating inside. Another consideration has been steam, but yet again, we have learned that the potential risk to occupants who are inside the fire building are minimal particularly when compared to the superheated temperatures that would exist prior to water application. We've also learned that forcible entry openings should be considered as ventilation. Simply opening a door can cause significant increase in temperatures inside the fire building. We've been reminded of the importance of closing doors and compartmentation inside the fire building. These are just a few of the key concepts from the research that we encourage you to review and research in detail to see the facts for yourself. The goal for us today is to incorporate the lessons from the research into our tactical plans and bring these concepts to our fire ground. We've been doing this research for more than 10 years now, and we really got enough of it at this point where we're able to take the science to the street to really begin to impact firefighter knowledge and firefighter behavior based on the research we've been doing. What we've had in the fire service for many, many years is we have people who develop theories without a basis in science. What UL, NIST, and many other organizations are doing is they're giving us scientific-based information of which we will make the decision based upon the facts when you're standing in front of that structure. Well, there's a lot of tradition. There's a lot of history. There are a lot of fire service instructors that have been teaching firefighting a certain way for 20 years. And it's not that what they've been teaching is wrong, but perhaps bits and pieces are a little out of place or they don't understand why they're performing a tactic or maybe when they should be performing that tactic. And so it's important to get this into the literature, into the training manuals, into the training videos, uh, working through organizations like ISFSI and getting it out to instructors so they can learn, so they can teach it appropriately. So let's talk about how to incorporate the lessons from the research into your department's operations. Hanover Fire and EMS, a suburb of Richmond, Virginia, took on this challenge and developed a method that has improved the safety of their firefighters and approved the efficiency of their fire attack operations. The acronym SLICERS was created to guide initial engine company attack operations. The purpose for the acronym was to provide a context to incorporate the research into an already aggressive and well-practiced tactical plan. The department found it essential to update their tactics to improve firefighter safety. In today's day and age, fires have become more volatile and more dangerous with the use of synthetics and lightweight construction techniques. Our department has been following the research from NIST and UL. We believe there's enough information to save lives now. As fire chief, I felt compelled to institute change. 
not only to improve the efficiency of our initial fire attack operations, but to protect the lives of our firefighters. The concept adopted by Hanover Fire and EMS incorporates seven steps, five that are intended to occur in a sequential manner, and two that may occur at any point in the operations. They are size up, locate the fire, identify the flow path, cool from a safe location, and extinguish the fire. The R for rescue and S for salvage are listed to the side because they are considered actions of opportunity. The slicer's method is intended to serve as the initial attack sequence for the first arriving companies at a structure fire. Its predecessor, Reseo VS, serves as command priorities, guiding the command thought process for the incident commander. Let's start with the first letter of the SLICER's acronym and discuss size up. We have become fairly familiar with size up concepts over the years, and those same themes continue here. But we still have a lot to learn about sizing up our fires on arrival and throughout the incident. Size up from the outside doing that initial 360 is so important. You need to account for the wind. You want to keep the wind at your back. You need to see where the fire is and where it wants to go. Play that through in your mind and then come up with your tactics. Decide what you want your firefighters to do. It's not a one size fits all situation. Uh, many times I hear firefighters tell me, you know, Dan, every fire is different. You're only doing science on, you know, dozens of fires or hundreds of fires. I say, well, that's true, but the physics are the same every time. And I agree, every fire response is different, right? The time of day, who the crew is, what your, what your resources are, where the hydrants are on that street, how advanced the fire is when you get there, all those sort of things. So it's true, every fire that they respond to is different. But then many of those same firefighters will tell me, I'm going through the front door every time. It just doesn't make any sense. Prior to selecting strategy for an incident, the incident commander must do a 360 degree look around the entire structure to make sure that they got as many facts as possible before they make the critical decision of interior, exterior, offensive, defensive, whatever title you call it, that 360 degree size up is a critical component to that decision making process. The next step in the sequence is to locate where the fire is in the building. The research has shown us that fires are more likely to go what is called vent limited, meaning that firefighters may not see clear signs of fire when they arrive. Yet the fire may be in the building just waiting for an unsuspecting firefighter to open a door or a window, giving the fire the air that it has been waiting for to support combustion. During the locate phase of the slicers concept, we encourage company officers to carry the thermal imaging camera on their 360 survey. This allows them to see thermal areas that are normally obscured by smoke. This also allows them to plan for how they will attack the fire. So during the locate the fire step, our goal is to determine where the fire is inside the building using all of the tools at our disposal. We need to make an assessment of the fire conditions, looking for signs of elevated temperatures in the building, reading smoke conditions, and looking for signs of high pressure. If the signs of a working fire are present, proceed to the next step. The research has shown us that it is critical to understand and be able to identify flow paths on the fire ground. Fire officers should become accustomed to recognizing open doors and windows, on arrival, and fire conditions, including the neutral plane if fire is visible. When fires are vent limited, a tactic may include withholding ventilation until hose lines are in place. This will help limit fire growth until crews are ready for cooling and extinguishment. This could be as simple as closing an open door or waiting to create building openings. Flow path control devices are now available on the market to assist with controlling and limiting air movement in the fire building. These may be applied on exterior openings or inside the building to limit the threat of rapid fire growth. Identification and control of flow path is a critical step to improving firefighter safety. Identifying the flow path is extremely important. Firefighters are going to make openings in order to be able to put the fire out. They need to be able to decide whether they want to control those openings or just know that they're in the flow path and operate safely and quickly in that condition. There's many things you can do. You might want to close the door before you go in to choke the fire to stop allowing the fire to have the oxygen to build up and develop. 
Uh, you may want to use door control when you send a search crew in or the hose crew in, keeping somebody at the door to do number one, accountability, sound the exit for them and limit the air so it slows down the fire development if you have to go in that way. If you have an option to go in and not be on the exhaust portion of the flow path, but on the inlet of the flow path, that's certainly the best choice. And how many times have we heard fire chiefs that have sustained a line of duty death in their department the following week during the funerals making statements of how rapidly conditions changed. It's all about a change of ventilation that resulted from the firefighters being in a safe place to being in the exhaust portion of the flow between where the fire is and where the fire wants to go. Once the fire has been located in the building and the flow path has been managed, the next step is to cool the superheated compartments and reduce the thermal threat to firefighters via flashover. Using the information gained during size up and the locate the fire step, the company officer determines the best place to cool the fire in a manner that is safe for their crew. This is entirely dependent on the building construction and the fire conditions at that time. There's no such thing as always attack the fire from the outside or the inside. It's the decision that the company officer makes based on the conditions. We have found that in most residential settings, we've been able to apply a fairly direct attack from the exterior. In a few rare occasions, we've been unable to hit hallways or closets, but for the most part, we're able to cool that superheated compartment, allowing our firefighters to get inside. Once the fire has been cooled, it is vital that firefighting crews make entry into the building to fully extinguish the fire. Failure to make a timely attack at the seat of the fire can result in dangerous fire growth. Crews must be conditioned to move quickly to assure the fire is extinguished. One thing that we'd learned in developing the slicers concept is we were very good at advancing hose lines. We lacked a little efficiency in removing hose lines or backing them and carrying them in a different direction. Therefore, on the drill ground, we drop the initial hose line, the pump operator has a backup line set for us, for us to enter and continue our firefighting efforts. During the extinguishment phase, crews enter the building and resume what could be considered as traditional tactical operations. The fire must be completely extinguished and the building overhauled to assure no rekindles. Additionally, primary and secondary searches should be conducted as normal to assure no one is in the building. This completes the sequential process of the slicer's concept. It leads us to the actions of opportunity, rescue and salvage. These may occur at any point during the incident, depending on the situation. Rescue remains the highest priority of the fire department when operating at a structure fire. The information gained during size up dictates where rescue falls into the incident priorities. When we arrive on the scene and have confirmed entrapment, we will obviously make rescue our highest priority. However, when we arrive in a residential setting and we're met by the occupants who can confirm that their entire family and their pets are accounted for, we move rescue to a lower priority. This gives us the ability, as we always would, to conduct our primary and secondary surge, but only after the thermal threat has been reduced. The challenge for departments operating with limited staffing is when three firefighters arrive with active fire and a known rescue situation. In a perfect world, the department would have the staffing to allow for simultaneous tactics, initiating a search and rescue effort while reducing or removing the thermal threat at the same time. But with limited staffing, the company officer is forced to make uncomfortable choices. Which tactic is the priority to protect the occupants, removing them from the structure, or knocking down the fire threat to remove the hazard? With limited staffing, we've learned to adjust. We have the pump operator do what he can to reduce the thermal threat while the officer and the firefighter work to remove trapped occupants based on a vent and or isolate search technique. The fire service has become familiar with the concept of vent and or search. Given the lessons learned through the fire dynamics research, we've learned the importance of using a closed door to prohibit flow paths and controlling fire growth. To reinforce that lesson, isolate has been added to the vent and or search concept to create the VEIS method. It is important to train firefighters to close the door when searching a room to ensure a flow path is not created during the search process. We take the information gathered throughout our scene size up and from occupants at the fire to determine the most likely location where occupants may be trapped. We then rapidly enter that space, close the door in an effort to control the fire flow path. 
During a VEIS operation, isolating that flow path is extremely important because the moment that door gets controlled, it will immediately improve conditions in the room where you're searching and going to potentially find a victim. Another place where door control is extremely important is in the case of vent, enter, isolate, and search. Uh, you don't want to change the ventilation condition until you're ready to make entry to the room. So the idea of taking the ladder and breaking the window before you climb up to the top of the ladder is not a good idea. You want to foot the ladder, uh, get it to the sill, go up, decide if you still want to make entry in the room, look at conditions in the room, take that window, and then immediately go to get the door closed if the door's not closed already. Otherwise, you're putting yourself and the victim in that exhaust portion of the flow path, and conditions, tenable conditions, are going to deteriorate very rapidly in terms of toxic gases and increased heat levels in that room. And so it's very critical that when you make that entry, you use that door to cut off the flow path. And you can cut off the flow path with the door at either an inlet or an outlet. Either end, you can stop it up. Salvage rounds out the slicer's method, with firefighters using everything from compartmentalization to salvage covers to protect property to the greatest extent possible. Remember to close doors as you move through the structure to limit smoke and water damage. Many ask, where does the previous Recio versus method developed by Lloyd Lehman fit with the slicer's method? We found that Recio VS still makes a lot of sense from a command perspective. As a first arriving battalion chief, it's critical that I use Recio VS to recall the incident priorities in an effort to ensure that rescue is made, exposures are managed, and extinguishment takes place. So slicers is being used by our initial arriving company officers and Recio VS can still be used by our commanding officers for overall priorities. So to review, the slice section is designed to occur in order and is typically carried out by the first arriving engine company. The R and S for rescue and salvage may occur at any time depending on the needs of the incident. As a formal incident command post is established, the Recio versus concept still applies, guiding the overall strategies of the incident. The slicer's method is an example of how one department incorporated the lessons from the fire dynamic research into their tactics to improve firefighter safety. The challenge for fire departments around the world is to incorporate these lessons in a way that works for them at the local level. Slicers, we like it. The International Society of Fire Service Instructors adopted the acronym SLICERS because we saw the need to take the research and develop some training for the American Fire Service. We encourage departments to take the research that NIST and UL have done take it home and if you can adopt the SLICERS acronym that's great or develop your own training and tactics based upon the research. That way everyone goes home. For more information on SLICERS or fire dynamic research go to the ISFSI website. We hope you will share this information with your department and more importantly take it out to the drill ground for training. From the research burns here in Spartanburg, South Carolina, I'm Eddie Buchanan. Be safe, stay aggressive, and keep training.